May 1998. Of course, I'm still at Frame Art, making picture frames. I say of course, because I just got the job a couple months ago, and I worked there for like seven years. Um, still hanging out with Jane, going to midnight movies. I don't remember if I've mentioned that. Uh, our local movie theater had midnight shows on the weekends, and I know we saw uh, Phantoms, the Dean Koontz-based movie, and um, Mystery Science Theater 3000, the movie, which is absolutely hilarious. We laughed our asses off. We rewatched it, uh, quoted it all the time. And I feel like there's others. I know we went to see other stuff at the midnight shows, but can't remember uh, what else there was. But I also did some reading, and that's what we're here for. I assume that's what you're here for. So let's get started. The first book that I read in May of 1998 was Popcorn by Ben Elton. And this is about, you see me grabbing my little notebook with my notes. It's about a director. His name is Bruce. He makes ultra-violent but stylish movies. Basically, he's Quentin Tarantino. And there's this couple. Um, let's find their names. Wayne and Scout, who are killers. Think uh, the Woody Harrelson, Juliette Lewis couple from Natural Born Killers, or the Tim Roth, Amanda Plummer characters in Pulp Fiction. Um, but this is a this is a satire, and it asks the question: Does uh, pop culture, does cinema, does mass media, whatever, create these killers? Does the media coverage perpetuate the killing? Um, and so that's that's basically the kind of book that it is. I don't recall if it answers, gives us an answer to those questions. Um, I think it is all eventually leads to like the red cop carpet on Oscar night. Um, but if you're interested in, in crime fiction, satire, Hollywood, Popcorn by Ben Elton. Then we have one of those problematic authors, people. Uh, the next book up is The Dilbert Future by Scott Adams. Scott Adams, creator of the Dilbert comic strip. Very problematic person. Just lots of crazy things he says and does on social media. Uh, this is another book that's a mix of essays and comic strips. And he's basically predicting the future, trying to prepare us for the future in his comedic way. And I'll admit, I found these books funny uh, back in the day. I think especially this one, since he's talking about the future from 1998, uh, I do think it would be interesting to go back and read it, see what he has to say, see how much it contrasts with the kind of things he says today. Um, but... I don't want to support him in any way. So let's move on to the next book, which is Dinosaur Summer by Greg Bear. And this book supposes that The Lost World by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was real. It was a true story. The, uh, the place where the dinosaurs were is a real place. And so in the world of Dinosaur Summer... Uh, uh, there, there are dinosaur theme parks and dinosaur circuses and such, but they are, um, uh, the, these attractions are dying. There's basically one dinosaur circus left and the dinosaur trainer, I think, wants to return the dinosaurs to the lost world. And there's a National Geographic photographer that's going to, um, uh, chronicle this ad this little adventure, and he brings his son along. Um, so I think maybe our perspective is from this 14-year-old, and I believe Ray Harryhausen 
the great, the late great Ray Harryhausen is a character. Uh, but it's a, it's a rollicking adventure story in the vein of Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World. Um, and, uh, yeah, possibly my favorite Greg Bear, because typically he's, like, real hard science fiction. This is a little more fun. And then, one would think this sounds like it would be a companion piece to that, but I don't think it is. <laughs> we have Doc Savage, The Forgotten Realm by Kenneth Robeson, Robison, however you say that last name. Uh, and there's there's this guy who's called the X-Man, X for unknown, and he's uh, locked up in a mental hospital because uh, everyone thinks he's nuts, because he's, 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 he shows up, I feel where he shows up, but he's wearing a toga, speaking in Latin, he's got these seeds, and so he's locked up, he's tending to his seeds, but he breaks out, and causes some problems, why well, you know, to bring Doc Savage in, but it's a typical Doc Savage rollicking adventure spanning the globe that eventually will lead to a forgotten realm, I assume. It's been a while since I read it. I might have a copy. It's been reprinted in the big trade paperback editions uh with the, the further adventures of Doc Savage, and I have a few of those. But I don't recall if that's one. And they are really buried back there. So I did not check. I did check my stack of the old paperbacks, and I didn't see it there. Uh, but let's move on. Now, if you had asked me 30 minutes ago if I had read this book, I would have said no. Which is horrible. I might lose half my subscribers for this blasphemy. But the fifth book that I read in May of 1998, I have no memory of reading this, Sacrament by Clive Barker. Um, so this is about, did I write anything down? No. It's about a wildlife photographer. He has an accident, um, uh, falls into a coma and sort of relives while he's in the coma, relives his life with this mysterious couple. See, I'm going off of what I read on Amazon. And then when he w finally comes out of the coma, he's got to, I don't know, figure his life out, figure out the world. Um... Yeah, I don't remember reading this. And I don't know if it's... I, I haven't read tons of Clive Barker. I think I've read a decent amount. Uh, you know, he's not like Stephen King pumping out books all the time. But I, I, I don't remember the book at all. Seeing it on the list made me go, yeah, I, I, obviously I read it. Maybe I remember... I could picture the cover immediately, but my apologies to all the Clive Barker fans out there. Uh, I don't have a copy of it at the moment. I am slowly rebuilding my Clive Barker collection, and it is one that I will pick up again. With that, co I want that paperback copy with the fox on the cover. All right, then we have Trace by Warren Murphy. And I think this is the only book in the Trace series that I don't have. There might be another one, but I know I don't have this one. Unfortunately, it's the first book in a series about Devlin Tracy. He's an insurance investigator, uh, lives in a casino in Vegas, and drinks, and I think he's engaged uh, to a sex worker, perhaps just an exotic dancer. Um... But he's on retainer with this insurance company, and they have a patient that's in like hospice who dies shortly after signing everything over to their doctor. And then the insurance company has another patient that's also there in that same hospice who's not doing well, and so they send Trace in to find out if, uh, if everything's on the up and up. And it's, uh, I, I really like these books. They're fun. Uh, Trace is a fun character. And they're they're pretty breezy. Snappy dialogue. Just 
good, fun mystery books. Uh, speaking of which, the one book that I do have on hand, Fletch Reflected by Gregory MacDonald. I believe chronologically, story-wise, this is the very last Fletch story. Um, and it's... Uh, previous to this was Son of Fletch, which introduced us to the Son of Fletch. And now that character has become our main character. And so Fletch's son, does he even have a name? Jack. <laughs> Jack Fletcher. Um, he is contacted by an ex-girlfriend who's getting married into this rich family and her future father-in-law keeps having these accidents. And the, uh, the fiancé, the ex-girlfriend, depending, fiancé, depending on your point of view, wants Jack Fletcher to look into it. So he, he gets, he's the pool boy at this huge um, estate. So he can look into things. And one of the people there has, is the, the inventor of the perfect mirror. Which, they explain this whole thing, how, you know, when you look in a mirror, let me start that over. When you're looking at a person, this is their left side, you're seeing their left side against your right side, and their right side against your left side. And the same thing, but when you look in a mirror, you're seeing your right side against your right side, and your left side against your left side. Hopefully you can follow this. The perfect mirror basically flips your image so you're seeing yourself the way the world sees you. So you're actually seeing your left side against your right side and your right side against your left side. Somehow this is supposed to be better. This is the one thing in this I did not understand. Maybe someone can explain, can explain to me why this is important. I don't know. But anyway, this is one of the characters. Um... Jack Fletcher starts to have some problems, so he calls his dad in. Fletch shows up. Uh, it's entertaining. I like it. It's not as good as Son of Fletch, um, in my opinion. But it is still, uh, it's definitely not the weakest of the Fletch books. Um, but it's not, I, I wouldn't put it in my top five either. But Fletch Reflected, I mean... It's good fun. It's There's no reason not to read it. Unless you just hate mysteries. And smart-ass characters. And then finally, the last book that I read in May of 1998 is Urban Nightmares, edited by Josepha Sherman. Josepha Sherman. I don't know how to pronounce that. And Keith R.A. DeCandido. Never sure how to pronounce his name either. <laughs> um, this is a, uh, an anthology of urban-based horror stories, uh, almost a who's who of writers at the time that aren't Stephen King, Dean Koontz, Clive Barker, Ramsey, uh, anthology writers, but not horror writers necessarily. Just tons of names that I recognize, including, wrote some down, Mike Resnick, Kristen Catherine Rush, or Christine Catherine Rush, Jody Lynn Nye, Anne McCaffrey has a story in there. Um, authors' names, again, that I've seen many times in many places at the time. Um, and I think typical anthology, you know, good stories, bad stories. But having looked it up on Amazon, fantastic cover. I really, really like the cover of the paperback. But that's Urban Nightmares, anthology of urban horror stories edited by Josepha Sherman and Keith R.A. DeCandido. And that is what I read in May of 1998. Um... I did not, you know, I had planned on coming up with a question before I started this video, and then I didn't. I just dove right in. So, um, 
Let me ask you this. I don't know if this is something that will be anything someone can answer. Um, do you have any thoughts on legacy characters? Uh, which is essentially a, a new character taking over the taking the place of an old character. Uh, we've seen it most recently, I would say, in the Scream franchise. At least that's what comes to the top of my head. We had Sidney Prescott, um, played by Nev Campbell, in the first four Scream movies. And then she's, we got a small part in number five, but we're introduced to, and, uh, you know, the other two, Courtney Cox and David Arquette come back. Uh, but we're introduced to basically legacy characters. Some of them are even related to the older characters. And then in Scream 6, which I haven't seen yet, we're following those legacy characters. Uh, and of course, I bring this up because of Fletch. Uh, there's the whole series of Fletch books, and then we're introduced to his son, and it seems, I don't know if Gregory McDonald's plan was to continue doing books that now featured Fletch's son or not, um, but I, I would have read those. I, as I said, I really liked Son of Fletch. I enjoyed this one well enough. I would have wanted to continue to follow the character. I think the biggest place you see this sort of thing, legacy characters, is comic books, of course. Um, I say that like it's obvious, and I could be completely wrong. Uh, but you have um, <laughs> The Flash, Barry Allen, sacrificed... I'm not going to go all the way back to the original Flash. His name, Jay Garrick. I was going to say his name escapes me, but Jay Garrick. We're gonna, we're not gonna go that that far back. We had Barry Allen, the Flash. He brought on Wally West, Kid Flash. Barry Allen sacrifices himself in the Crisis, and then Wally West becomes the Flash. Um, Jonathan Kent has taken the mantle of Superman. Clark Kent's still around, still doing his thing, but there are points where. These characters take on the mantle. Um, so they're legacy characters. Uh, so what are, what are your thoughts on that? Is it something that you've come across? Do you want the do you want to just hold on to the original characters? Oh, we can go back to Doc Savage. DC did this at one point in the 90s, 80s or 90s when they got the Doc Savage license i think it was in the 80s or 90s and they in the first issue or two they sort of did some generational stuff so that we ended up with um doc savage the well the third but he's the fourth because clark savage jr so and then it was his son clark savage the third and then Clark Savage the fourth, and he ended up being the one that we were following. Um, so again, do you do you care? Do you want to hold on to the originals? Do you like to see the torch passed to other characters? Uh, again, is this not something that has ever crossed your mind? Um, I'm trying to think. I feel like there's another movie franchise that just popped into my head, and yet I. I can't quite pull it out of there. Uh, but let me know what you think. Legacy characters. Is it a thing? Let me know in the comments. Well, I know it's a thing. Is it a thing for you? Let me know in the comments below. If you have any comments, questions, or corrections, please put those in the comments below. Comments are open for spoilers. Just post a spoiler warning. We try to be polite here on my channel. Um, please like, share, and subscribe. All the usual YouTube stuff. If you care to follow me on other social media, my Twitter Still, holding on, my Twitter is at Ronan5757, my Instagram where I post pictures of books, comic books, board games, and fuzzy animals is ericsmith5757, that's Eric with a K, E-R-I-K-S-M-I-T-H-5757. That is all I have for you this week, so until next week, read more books.